Hey, what's good everybody? My name is Alchemy. Welcome to the channel. Today, you and I are going to be talking about the five principles of sound design. Now, this is a concept that I made up. Just lo and behold, don't take it as gospel, but it's something that I think about and try to utilize in order to simplify my process and in order to troubleshoot a lot of the things that I'm trying to do whenever I'm creating new sounds. Now, this is a very big departure because I'm not trying to go for something very specific. It's more so of how do I want to shape a sound, characterize it, and then express it. So the five principles of it are frequency, excuse me, frequency content, loudness, stereo fields, movement, and the final one, which is the hardest to do, but also like uh, is context. Because if you're just doing sounds to make sounds, then it doesn't matter. But context is really important when you put it in terms of either musical expression or you put it in terms of implementation to supplement another source of media like video or sound effects or video games or you know what I'm saying? So if this sounds interesting to you, I'm going to briefly gloss over these kind of things and uh, just kind of give you an introduction about kind of how to manipulate that and how to think about these things. I will say it's going to be up to you to learn the tools of which controls that realm, right? So it's un it's important to understand how reverb works because that shapes volume, it shapes tails, it can also shape stereo. It's important to learn about distortion because now we're talking about frequency content and filters because that reduces or sometimes boosts depending on what you're doing. And then there's this extra step, which is the really fun part of abusing effects that are supposed to be for one thing, but you're doing it for another. For example, if you're trying to, you know, control the volume of something and you put a limiter on it, but then you keep turning the volume up, it creates more harmonics because you're now distorting the signal past or like you're smashing everything up to a point where it squarifies everything. It's really fun, but uh, maybe for another video. So frequency content, uh, volume, stereo field, movement. We're going to be focusing on those for today because I do a lot of other videos that's based on production. I would love it if you subscribe to the channel. We got new merch. You can check out alchemy.com or book a lesson with me if you want to go further into what we're discussing today. So the coolest thing about phase plan or about serum or any other wavetable synthesizer is most of them have something called a wavetable maker and as you can see we've got this cute little sine wave and you'll see that regarding frequency content this is a single harmonic this goes from one all the way up to it looks like a thousand is the top one and if this is completely full generally speaking it creates a white noise. So every single harmonic that's completely flat is white noise. I think that ironically, if you turn every single harmonic up on this, it's going to sound more like a saw wave, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it sounds like a crappy saw wave. But in most cases, just know that whenever all of the frequencies are kind of like this, then we end up sculpting from noise. So whenever we are working on controlling frequency ranges, generally speaking, this fundamental, usually there's some specific use cases, is the most important thing because this helps identify the source of the pitch. So when I talk about that with regards to pitch, it means that if I play an F, if this if we have a single heart or the first harmonic, that means that it's going to represent F. If we have not a first harmonic, but a second harmonic, and that's the most prominent harmonic here, it's going to be an octave. So I'm not really gonna get into the harmonic series on here and you can do more information, but as you go up, there is a musical relationship. I highly suggest checking out Noise's Patreon and Nick Ruse's video on harmonic series and bass design because it's fantastic. That being said, just know that there is a musical relationship with this, but only the first harmonic is going to be the exact representation of what key you play. So from there, if we have nothing, you know, and this is just one way to build harmonics, we can utilize this to start to create different kinds of shapes. And as you can see, it begins to transform and starts to shape. Now, I don't want to get into specifics about what you should do and how to, you know, manipulate this into a specific sound, but understanding that this is a great way to start learning about frequency content. That is like a frequency content, I guess, harmonics. This is an excellent tool for you to kind of just get used to seeing what's happening. The other tools that we have are things like distortion. So if I were to maybe go from here to here, and we just pull up a distortion, you're gonna see that the waveform is gonna to begin to change. So now this is the shape that we have, and the more that I drive this, you can see that it's beginning to squarify. 
if we look at this representation on say an aux and we take this and set this over here please don't try to follow this this isn't like listen to what i'm saying don't try to follow this as a sound design video you can see the more drive that i have the more that this waveform is turning into a square because it's taking both this signal and this signal and sending it out to this sorry this signal is going into this signal just because i know that some people want to correct me but if i were to change the distortion perhaps maybe to saturate or maybe to fold back you'll see that now we're getting different shapes and so utilizing distortion and then also utilizing things like filtering can also help shape <coughs> we need to switch this over can also help shape what the waveform looks like because the more that i start to filter this now the more that it's going to start to look more like a sine wave and the more that we open it up, let's say I've got a couple of these, you can see that this waveform here is beginning to kind of just transform into different stuff. And so sometimes by automating things like this, you know, or changing the different distortion types or utilizing this or using a combination of the frequencies, using the combination, sorry, of the harmonic wavetable maker, utilizing distortion and utilizing filtering, a lot of times this is how we shape different kinds of bases and stuff. There's other procedures that you can do, for example, PM and FM, sync and all that stuff, but essentially it's a mathematical equation that you are applying to whatever your source waveform is. Just know that this stuff works best with basic waveforms all the way up to a square. The more that you have a complex wavetable, the more that this begins to sound like noise. So if we do just take something that is, yeah, you see how many lines and whatever this is, this is gonna eventually just sound like, well, like noise. So I don't need to play this, but you can see it looks like little crackles and stuff. If we look at a waveform of what noise looks like, look, little crackles and stuff. It's very similar. It's not the same, but you can see that there's, there's a, a relation there. So it's up to you to discover what kinds of effects and what kinds of things can affect a sound uh, frequency based. The easiest thing that we can talk about is probably the most fundamental, which is volume. Now volume coincides with motion a lot because volume isn't even just a means of how loud is it, it's also a means of what does it do. So if we were to make this into something like this, um, it's going to kind of sound kind of like a key, I guess. We need to turn this off. Now, if we were to adjust this and actually have some tail, well, now this is going to become more so of a pad, right? If I want this to be percussive, then I can change this into a key, or sorry, into a plug. And if I just want this to be a bass, then I can just leave it as is and play a low note and maybe pull off of the release. Sometimes there is a call for this. Sometimes you want to do a little bit of both, but if you can see, as I control the sound, Sometimes you want to do a little bit of mixing between, so you've got a really loud sound, kind of like if I were to play the guitar. The natural replication of a plucked string is that it, the loudest part is the initial, which is the attack of the sound, and then it fades out. So I wouldn't call this a pad, but it's something that has a natural resonance that's being left over, right? <laughs> So if I were to try to make something like a guitar, the first thing that I would look for is getting the same kind of volume shapes, the same kind of control with what happens when I pluck the string versus how long does it take to go completely silent. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but volume control is incredibly important, not just as a means of mixing, but as a means of characterizing what kind of sound you want to use. And then also certain volumes and stuff like if you turn a signal down and you add more distortion to it and then it gets loud again and then you turn it down, there are certain tricks that you can utilize, but the volume aspect of it is a huge dimension to what it is that you're trying to do. It is a great way to change the difference between playing something softly and playing something loud and aggressive. So, you know, I played this really hard, but if I play this soft, I don't even think you can hear that now, but... 
the timbre changes, the the way that it moves through air and creates, you know, the all that stuff, the air pressure changes and whatnot is different. And I'm not saying that you should think about sound design as real life instruments, but this is a great example about understanding how something works, you know. Now, when it comes into application, right? If you're trying to make a drum, well, what does a drum need to do? Is a drum going to go, ah, oh, no, it's percussive. So it needs to be something that's short, has a strong transient, something that is, you know, relatively in your face. You can do some, you know, like light drums too, but understanding that dimension and knowing what that sound is doing will help you get closer to what you're trying to achieve. So the third one is a little bit easier to explain. We have stereo. So some really easy ways to apply stereo are perhaps adding unison. So even if I don't have any detuning on this, if I play this, let's go ahead and turn that back up. But then I spread it out. You should be listening on headphones or speakers. If you're on a mono signal, you're not going to hear this at all. But So what are you doing to your stereo field? Are you using delays? You know, are you, sorry, I went for distortion. Um, are you, yeah, using delays to where you spread this out really wide? Are you using reverb to spread a signal out? Are you using a combination of both? These are the kinds of things that go into account with usually putting something within a physical space. Uh, talking about like building reverbs and stuff or building rooms is a really fun concept. That's why convolution is such an amazing tool. But essentially at the heart of what you're doing, you are taking a sound and saying, okay, I'm giving it space. Stereo field, that is, the, that is essentially space. If something is mono, that means it's right in front of you. And that means that all of the energy is going to be the exact same between your speakers. If it's stereo, that means that there's going to be differences between the left channel and the right channel. There is totally a thing of like surround sound and all that but to be honest with you i have never had the opportunity to work in surround sound so i can't educate you on that matter but it still applies of some aspect of stereo perhaps you're instead of left and right you've got five systems now to where you can have part of the sound over here part of the sound over here part of the sound over here but the fact of the matter is that we still only have two ears we have a left ear and a right ear so the thing with dimensions and, and space comes into something called diffusion, where there's this natural phenomenon that the further away something is, the more muffled it sounds. You can get into that idea of, uh, you know, how far certain frequencies travel. That's why bass generally has more energy because it will go further and travel further, whereas really high energy or high pitch sounds tend to um, fizzle out faster. So, you know, you can look into the science of it and there's, you know, certain aspects of that, but really I want to keep it within the realm of music about spreading something out, right? Do I want it to be here? Or do I want it to be nice and wide? Do I want to find, you know, Goldilocks and be just right? So understanding stereo will kind of help characterize your sound even more and help not even necessarily so much with timbre, but the space of which it needs to exist. And a lot of times, you know, if you listen to you know, brass in a huge orchestral room, it'll be very strong up front, but then even after it will ring out through the, uh, through the, the, the concert hall or the chamber or wherever it's being played. Uh, sometimes keys have that. Everything usually has a natural reverb. If something has zero reverb in it, um, like generally speaking, you don't like sound doesn't travel very far at all. So they have those rooms that are like completely silent to where like, no matter how loud you scream, you can't hear anything. And that's because there's insane amounts of phase cancellation that's happening behind everything but generally speaking um, when you create an echo you're sending something out in a space that's why it's really cool to like you know say something on top of the mountains right because the sound is big wide open and it travels further and resonates within the mountains themselves and creates reflections uh, whereas when you talk about reverb it's actually creating a tail that's not separated from the initial sound it's a continuation of the sound right and then that tends to spread out as well, which goes hand in hand with volume and stereo spreading and whatnot. But that's something that kind of, yeah, I don't know. This stuff just fascinates me and is really cool. So the last piece of this, or sorry, the, the, the next piece of this that I want to discuss is the aspect of movement. We already kind of touched on it with the idea of volume, but there's other and like a vast different way to create movement within your piece. For example, delay creates movement. <laughs> Right? We've created emotion. When you do filtering, you create emotion. So if I change over time, 
a chord that goes from full frequency range to no frequency range, then I've created movement within my sounds. And one really like super ace trick that I can teach you is that the more that you start to understand movement, the easier it is to have intention with the sounds that you make, regardless of like what quality they are. Because if you can make something have a relationship with another sound, then you essentially are like miles and miles ahead on making music. So like nature is a perfect example of that, right? If you go outside and you listen to the way that the birds talk to each other, like every bird has its own language, its own singing pattern and all that other stuff. But the way that we hear it, because it's a bunch of birds, is like, who, 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 you know what I'm saying? So I know that seems stupid, but the thing is, is that there's still this in this realm of which these birds are existing. And then you might hear like other things like squirrels or, you know, anything like that. But there's this ecosystem that's created to where even though they might not be talking directly to each other, there's still a relationship because the sounds are bouncing back and forth. Um, and that's really cool. And I don't know, dude, like once you start seeing music in the way that I'm describing, it's like music is freaking everywhere. And um, it's a beautiful thing. It's also really hard to turn off. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. What can you say? But yeah, talking about movement. So if you have something that's a pattern and then you, you know, relate it to something else, I just put up a video about bases and call and response and stuff. Then you start fortifying your relationship behind something else. If you've got a piece of drum, like a drum kit or rather a piece of drums, and let's just focus on the percussion to where it's like, but that repeats, it's a pattern. And you start thinking about creating instruments that have movement that create a relationship with your source, then what ends up happening is you're starting to create a dynamism. And there's all of these cool call and responses and you can change the focus and whatever of uh, what kind of movement you're creating that creates music in itself. Like music is not just chord progressions and melodies and all that. It literally is creating worlds to where everything has a relationship with each other. And, um, you are creating some kind of some kind of interaction, whether it be for the purpose of dance or an experience or, you know, trying to evoke an emotion or whatever, or even, you know, spoken words. But that is essentially like movement within sound is is kind of what helps keep our attention. And the more that you can create these relationships, that's why I love making IDM music so much, because it's exactly what I'm talking about. But like on crack, um, it really helps diversify and um what's the word that i'm looking for i can't think of the word but basically it makes your compositions a lot better so which goes into the fifth thing um if you are making music or sorry if you're making sounds for music or you're making sounds for a specific purpose otherwise than just making sounds as a hobby like look how cool my sound is there's nothing wrong with that but if you have intention on utilizing a sound then it's only as good as it is in context I can make this huge, but if I've got like a, I don't know, a really stupid loop, like a disco loop or something, and I just place it out of time, out of context, zero relationship, and I'm just throwing sounds together, then, you know, I, sure, like you can learn to appreciate it if that's what you decide to appreciate. But generally speaking, for the most part, it's harder to relate to for most people. I'll say that. Because uh, your music is your music, and I respect you and your autonomy, and um, I want to encourage you to do whatever you want. But yeah, so, but likewise, if you have something that's like, and you create a phrase that fits rhythmically within, you know, that, that beat, because we're talking about disco or whatever, right? If it's like, well, now they're they're playing with each other. There is a very clear and concise relationship of how these sounds are, are moving across, or, or sorry, are interacting with each other. And that's where the magic starts to happen. And when it comes into contextualizing bass, like I was talking about in the first video, when it comes into making other sounds work with each other, the relationship that they have is the most important part. Everything else that, that happens after that, you know, um, one of the my favorite sayings is that you either make stuff play nicely together or you make them take turns. And that really falls along with, you know, if you've got a bunch of instruments and they're not working together or whatever, it falls back within these dimensions that I'm explaining. Um, is something wrong? Like are two instruments competing for frequency range, for space, for volume? 
for movement. You know, maybe one of these movements are so erratic and this one is like maybe more smooth and it doesn't play along nicely. Or is the context of them just in the way that they're talking to each other not really like working well? So uh, this is a sound design thing, but it is also a compositional thing because it's, it's important to practice utilizing your sounds if you intend on making sounds to make music uh, or, ga <coughs> or games or sound effects or whatever. Um, I, I think it's so important, no matter what skill set you're at, to try to pit these sounds into your production because it's also going to help you develop as an artist and it's going to help develop your tastes and musical direction about what kind of stuff you like to make. So I know that this wasn't, you know, one of these videos that's like, yo, look how cool my sound is or whatever. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry if I'm long winded or whatever, but I really feel like embracing these principles and and kind of not thinking about like, oh, what distortion did I use or what, you know, what VST is this person using or, oh, he did this specific trick to achieve this specific sound. You know, you can make a, a sick freaking growl based with just wavetables. Like you don't need anything else. If you know what you're doing and you understand the relationship of how harmonics shift within a movement, it's the same as if I were to create this sound, whoa, that motion that I've created was a difference of me changing my frequency content of my voice through filtering, which is through my teeth, through my tongue, through, through my anatomy um, of my mouth. But also in the means of uh, modifying my vocal cords, right? Or maybe, I don't know, how much air, how much pressure I put out, something like that. I don't know, too technical. But what I'm saying is that you can express that through all of the effects that you have, through all of the tools that you're developing. And that's why I tell people like, no, you don't really need to invest in effects. You need to learn what effects do. You need to learn the relationship about how stuff sounds. And then down the road, when you start hearing and you have an ear for like very specific stuff, for example, the difference between analog and digital, you know what I'm saying? Or the difference between disc tube culture and trash, you know, or whatever. Um, that's going to be kinds of things that are going to be like refining your tools right but that should be so far down the line i really want to discourage you from even like looking at or purchasing anything it's really imperative that you understand the universe of how sound works and these five principles i think will help get you a much better idea about how to control all that so if that was interesting to you thanks so much for listening i have a question um what other kinds of topics do you want me to cover for one two what is your favorite childhood memory if you got to this far in the video i really appreciate everything check out alchemy.com if you're interested in uh, seeing what kind of sounds i have available uh, book a lesson with me or come into the streams i stream monday wednesday friday saturday and a lot of times i'm actually writing tunes where i'm utilizing all the stuff that i discuss within these video lectures that i have thanks everybody i appreciate your time have an awesome rest of your evening